The ironic thing about programmatic is that this is a concept that's covered just ad nauseum at events like this and, and in the press, but I think for a lot of people it's still a kind of a dizzying concept and, and it's really complex. And I think it's in part because there's a lot of different elements to programmatic advertising. And some of it really depends on what your organization is trying to achieve. So we have a really distinguished panel of people that are, are kind of executives in their field, but they come from very different organizations. And on the far left, we have Bon and Bao. He's the global VP of media and consumer engagement at Mondelez International. They're a global snacking company. In the middle, we have Sean Rigsecker, who is the founder and CEO of Centro, uh, and that's an advertising technology company. And then to my left, we have Kristen O'Hara, who is the chief marketing officer of Time Warner, uh, a global media and entertainment company. And we're going to help you try to demystify this topic and answer this question of when, when will programmatic advertising just be advertising. So I guess to all of you, high-level question just to kind of kick us off and set some context. How do you leverage programmatic advertising in your organizations, or how are you considering leveraging it? And any one of you can start. Sure, I'll start. Um, so welcome, everyone. Hopefully you've had a good day so far. Um, I think from a Time Warner perspective, we're looking at it um, in a holistic way. And by that, I mean we're looking at it across the three operating companies of Time Warner, so HBO, Warner Brothers, and Turner Broadcasting. But we're also looking at it from both a buying perspective and a selling perspective. And I think that's a unique position for us because there are very few companies that play on the buying side and the selling side at the scale in which we do. And most people usually think of us just on the publishing piece, but we're also a huge scale marketer of brands within Turner like TNT or CNN or the Warner franchises and all the slate of movies that they come out with every year and the amazing HBO brand. Um, so I think for us as we think about it, it starts from a data driven place. Um, as I think Shelley was talking about, there's so many definitions to what programmatic is. And for us, it starts with the data. And I think we're sitting at such a unique time, particularly in media and entertainment, where historically we didn't have access to as much consumer data that we do today. And because of mobility and devices, we're able to unlock so much more intelligence about what consumers are doing with our brands, our content, our products. So. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, I agree 100%. I think uh, it is, I, you know, it's a very interesting perspective where you sit because I only get to see one side of the coin or from the other publisher side. Um, so I, I think from our organization specifically, it's data data's at the center of it, but also the long view, which is um, how do we be, I've talked about this, it's a data arms race, but how do we begin to build the capability now to take advantage of the next, the change that's happening over the next two to three years, and I think, or three to five, let's say. I think the biggest unlock of that is still, on average, 20% of media that's bought is digital, but when that other 80%, which is traditional, begins to unlock in the programmatic space, that's when we think, you know, we wanna be prepared for that value unlock, and I think that's when inventory, which traditionally we didn't really know how to value, let's say, remnant for us if we're not a direct marketer, becomes really exciting because now it becomes about audience targeting versus, or individual targeting versus um, necessarily just programming, day parts, that kind of stuff. And so for us, that's, that's where we see the opportunity is how do we build that capability for the long term? And then the other component of programmatic, which I think, again, I think everybody talks about cost savings, which to us, that's just not, I mean, fine, we'll take it, but that's just, just not where the, the win is. The other play that we need to look at is the advent of real players like Facebook that represent identity in the future of what that looks like, the data that's thrown up there and how that matches to our retailer data, for example, the anonymization of retailer, moving away from things which are representative panels to actual big scale individual tracking that actually looks across our entire programmatic landscape. I think we've talked a lot about it, which is even if you go on Google right now and you look for programmatic value chain, nobody's talking about it. Nobody is literally, t literally you can't find any searches. Nobody's talking about all the different pieces that are gonna surround this. They're usually focused on very small, discrete areas, but it's that entire value chain which is gonna kind of transform how you operate as an organization. 
-hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually great. You know, I've got a really unique and different perspective on it. And when people ask to talk about programmatic, I'm always like, well, what do you mean by programmatic? You know, it's become mostly a definition, for the most part today, still meaning RTB. And uh, so the answer is, you know, what do we do? Every single thing, 100% of all the media that runs through Centro is bought through software. Everything is automated from vendor management, contracts, ad operations, integrations, all the way through reconciliation. Then we also have our RTB platform and so, and our partners that we work with. And so from that perspective, you know, if you say, well, what's RTB, which I think is what people mean programmatic, about 30 to 35% of our business is bought programmatically, but 100% of the entire corporation is automated in buying all the media that we do. I, I think that should be the definition too, by the way. It, programmatic is just software automating uh, the, the media buying process. But just to be clear, when you all are talking about programmatic, are you talking about display ads or does it go beyond that in, in other formats? So, um, no, it's not, it, so when we, everything that is bought through software, that includes display, it includes mobile, includes video, it includes social, um, and, what's that? And, 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 well, we're not doing TV yet though, at least network-based television or cable-based TV, but video, definitely all of that, and across all the different devices, you know, whether that's tablet, mobile, and, uh, and desktop. Is that the same for you as well, Fana? You're using programmatic technology to buy all media types, or have you bet on one, or how do you think about it? No, I mean, it's all media types. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's so amazing to hear this space, to hear conversation. I was literally just in London on a panel yesterday talking about the exact same thing, and it's amazing to hear there's confusion, and, and oh, well, what, what is programmatic? The bottom line is that any piece of media that can be bought through software will be bought programmatically. That's the bottom line. And we've seen markets do this already. It's nothing new. The financial markets went through the exact same automation phase and came out on the other side. And I, you know, I have a good friend who used to do something called beat the VWAP, which is weighted while you average. Uh, so basically, it was high, high touch, high value, uh, and they didn't think that they were going to be automated. Now they sit on the beach. They no longer sit on the floor of the exchange. They sit on the beach. They make more money uh, because now they're able to throw software algorithms, quants, like all that kind of stuff at it that makes it a way more efficient. And that happens in markets and exchanges, and that's what's going to happen here. There's no question about it. And so I guess to answer your question is that we are on a march. Anything that we can buy through software, why wouldn't we? Anything that we can get data back from that we can tie into out, why, wh why, why not? It's like not even a question. And uh, let's talk about some of the other benefits because it, definitely when people start talking about programmatic, you said it earlier, it's about cost savings and streamlining media buying. And, and you mentioned data as well. Are those the main benefits or are there other reasons why uh, y your organizations have, have embraced programmatic advertising? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that technology has always helped to drive efficiency in business and in life. But I think we're living at a very different moment in time. And I think if you connect the data with what technology is enabling us to do, it's not so much about efficiency, it's actually about intelligence. And it's actually about smarter decision making that can come faster and faster and faster. And so while efficiency, cost savings may be byproducts of what's happening, I think the larger opportunity, at least the way we're looking at it, is for that increased insight, intelligence, and speed of decision making around our businesses. And I think the benefits are slightly different when whether we look at that from the buying side or the selling side. You know, a quick, you know, my perspective on the RTB world and the rise of the platforms over the last really five to six years is that, and, and the benefits, you know, associated to it, is that we're kind of living in what I'll call platform version 1.0 right now. And Candidly, people want to talk about efficiencies, really meaning labor efficiencies. The truth of the matter is RTB and the platforms that exist today have created zero efficiency inside the advertising industry up to this point. Met with the uh, CMO, Fortune 500 client, and he said, you know, my agency is trying to get me to spend all my money with this trading desk. And they keep putting more and more, so, and they tell me it's so efficient. But every year, they want to add more FTEs to my account. And I go, well, why? And they go, well, we need more data scientists. And data analysts is like, well, what about all the other people that you're paying to? You know, so there's no, I don't think we've achieved the level of efficiency. Now, the idea is, and well, it's more effective. The reality of RTB is it's not, it's not more effective at this point. The effectiveness in RTB is not because it's somehow magically more effective. 
It's a fact that you can, that brands can buy tonnage of inventory a heck of a lot cheaper than they just could before RTB came into the business. Now, to me, that is just my story. That feels like the truth. Now, the promise of the pipes, of the bidding mechanisms, of the data mechanisms is what's critically important here. We are on a fast train to get to true one-to-one -one engagement, one-to-one -one marketing, connected to the CRM systems of, of, of brands, connecting to the CR systems of publishers, and bringing people together being a lot smarter with a lot faster um, repetition of data to make smarter decisions in real time, which we can't do you know, buying it the old-fashioned way. Yeah, I, I think wh when, when I hear you talk, it, it just it makes me realize how fast the pace of change has been. And, and what we thought of as programmatic just two years ago, it was real-time buying of banner ads. Uh, and then it was real-time buying of uh, y you know, video ads. And then it was uh, just uh, automating guaranteed buys. So in a space that just changes you know, every day and, and you're pulling your hair out trying to figure out what, what's real and what's not, how do you all kind of keep up with it? Um, because y you know, I think to uh, really understand what, what Sean just described, you have to have kind of a, a PhD in programmatics. So how do you do it? What See, advice do you I have? I disagree. I don't think it's that difficult. I mean, I think, to be perfectly honest, what we're talking about is the ads that are sold on computers should be driven by computer intelligence. And I mean, it's like the only reason why they were sold the way they were sold was because we brought old models over to, I mean, if you were building it and you really thought, Hello, it's the internet, it's a connected medium, why would, why, I don't understand. So, so I actually don't think that it's, and I also don't think it's a difficult concept. I think it's a pretty straightforward concept. I think what, what's difficult about it is that it's hard because we have to go through an emotional transference of people's roles and what, act, what they're doing now is not what they're gonna do tomorrow. And what got us to this point now is not what we're gonna do tomorrow. And I think that's what makes it very difficult. I think conceptually it's relatively straightforward. I mean, it's a, an exchange that's bought automatically. There's nothing big about that. I, I think there, there is but a perception that there's a lack of transparency. But there is a lot of transparency. Around programmatic, where, where does that come from? Because that, that's definitely one of the challenges when you talk to brands is that they're, they're worried about who's making money from them. Yeah, well, there is a lack of transparency. I mean, without, you should go, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take well, it. I, I mean, it's, it's, where does it come from? It's because there is. There is a complete lack of transparency in programmatic, in quotes, buying media right now. If you, you know, go back to, if a brand buys directly from Meredith Corporation, okay, they know that 100% of their ad spend went directly to the magazine. You know, today we've now got, you know, AORs, we've got trading desks, we've got data companies, we've got intermediaries, we've got, you know, data tech fees. You know, the, the numbers show that about 30 cents to 40 cents maybe of the dollar spent actually is given to the publisher who produces the content and engages with the visitors to reach. So therefore, until we get a lot of that cleared out, and by the way, that's gonna collapse. I mean, we just, it's not a sustainable market today. Um, the transparency will come to fruition, but right now there's a lot of companies making a lot of money and creating a lot of valuation off the uh, non-transparency. But I mean, I mean, I think agency trading desks are one of the because of their scale at buying are one of the biggest challenges. But I, I, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I think the biggest challenge is that we have put so much pressure on our media agencies to operate at razor thin margins. Razor, I mean 1%, 2% margins. That's, I can't run a business that way. And so when they see an opportunity to create additional value, of course they're gonna go after it. And they're 100% right, by the way, is that if we see transparency to it, potentially the greed of clients might go after trying to, you know, I think we as an industry have to say, okay, what is the real value of this? And we have to place real value and pay partners fair, you know, balance. I would say some of that, uh, two things, is one is that everyone does talk about the perceived transparency issue, but there, I there are things that programmatic has made more transparent, right? Price discoverability, availability of inventory, the value of specific audiences to both buyers and sellers and who they're valuable to, right? I think part of the problem is that there's a lack of knowledge by people who are sitting around the table and aren't necessarily always equipped to ask the right questions and to push for the disclosure that's needed um, to make them more comfortable in this situation. So I think there's a lot of folks who need to take more time to understand what's actually happening throughout the process and what each part of that ecosystem, what the role they're playing is um, in order to be more informed and make more informed decision making. But there, yeah, are partners, there are partners that do not provide price transparency. And so that's the only thing which is, which I, I don't believe it survives because as a big organization, I don't even really care about the price specifically. What I care about is am I getting better over right. time? And if I don't have pricing data, then I just don't know that. 
Bonnie, I think what you said a second ago, and I want to kind of paint the picture of where I feel we're going and in time frame associated to it, because I think what you said is so critical from a brand's perspective. Within three years, 100% of digital media buying will be completely automated. And what I mean by that is you're not, I'm not saying you're going to have software automation on the planning process and the buying process. I'm saying that you're going to go to the system, single sign-on, mobile, social, video, um, you know, display. You're going to put in what you want. You're going to put in where you want them, and you're going to put in what time you want. You're going to say, give the parameters what you're looking for, and the system's going to say, here's what you should do. And then you're going to say, I agree, disagree. I may move the dials up or down. You're going to press a button. Creative is going to get uploaded. It's going to be distributed electronically. It'll be up. It'll be running. It'll be auto-optimized. It'll be reconciled. Like, that's going to happen. That completely disrupts the media departments and the media you know, uh, uh, agencies for how they're currently structured. So what, what do you think happens? Let, let's riff off that a little bit. If all of a sudden software is automating all of these media agency functions right now, planning, buying, reporting, optimization, like w what is the role of, of a media agency in, in, in the future? Well, I, I just want to key off of where I was kind of going with this, what Bonin said, which is, you know, look, it is going to be disruptive. We've got really smart people, but over 50% of the people in a media agency, you know, by the way, Boston Consulting Group did a great report that, that they de delved deep in agencies. They said 80% of the time of a typical media person's job in an agency is devoted to nothing but rework and work that doesn't provide strategic value. So that's the opportunity. Fact is, these are really smart kids. They come in from great schools and we're not utilizing any of their creativity, their ideation, their ability to do other things. But we can't operate it with this FTE outdated model. You know, but I think that the brands who lean in with the agencies and the agencies who lean in and say, the world's going to be different in the future, how do we come up with a better model that actually uh, you know, uh, gets paid for the ideas, the content management, the content cr distribution, those things. To build off of that, I think one thing that is not talked about on the many, many panels and conversations that happen around this topic is the role of creativity in the agency in this space, whether that's within the media agency or the more traditional creative agencies. But I think there's so much focus around what programmatic is, and the name is so confusing and not something that I think a lot of creative people really want to give a warm big hug to. But if you think about the opportunities that it's going to unlock for brand storytelling in message sequencing and how brand stories can be told that you actually can control more of what's going out when and to whom um, in a more sequenced fashion, I think is really interesting and should get creative people excited. I think the opportunity for brand planners to not find insights that are based around the lowest common denominator of big, broad audiences that they often have to focus on today, but can be focused on more discrete messaging to micro targets in a larger um, audience segment should be like a dream come true and create a lot more creative freedom. And when we think about those factors, why in our own business would we look at marketing season two or three of a show, like take a true detective on HBO, why would we market that show the same way to a season one super fan going into season two as we would a brand new person we're trying to weave into that franchise? Or if you look at some of our big franchise properties, it puts a whole different context on how you're gonna maybe manage those franchises to some of these micro segments. Like you might, you know, Batman, Superman, based on behavior and different sequence of messaging that you put out in front of those audiences. So I think there's a ton of creativity that hasn't been unlocked here and that there is a lot of opportunity within agencies for that. Yeah, that's my favorite part of what we do, by the way, is we, uh, by automating things that, that are messy and in, in the, the logistics of ad buying, it should free people up to be creative and, and strategic and, and help them learn faster. It just feels like because the technology is moving so fast, the business models are, are lagging a little bit, and that that's what the agency world need, needs to figure out. I don't think, you know, again, first of all, I 100% agree, because that I think we are facing a creative renaissance that we've never seen before, and I think that part of it, though, is that the creative agencies have actually been left out of the discussion and the conversation and a large por portion of it, and that's a big issue, I feel. I also think that part of that is, you know, I, as a client, I think we have to take on a lot of the responsibility. I think part of that is because the clients haven't 
uh, haven't asked for it. I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of this ecosystem is built to service the needs of the guys who are writing the checks, which happen to be the clients. And so if the clients begin to demand this more, then guess what? The ecosystem changes to meet those needs. And so, again, I'm a firm believer that I think right now the clients have not leaned in and I think it's not really just about leaning in. It's also about the opportunity here is, is accelerating the growth of your businesses. So there's a lot of money that's being left on the table. To your point, right on. Why target a person who already is part of the franchise the same way that you target somebody who's new? And if you do that, there's a lot of money being left on the table. But the client segment has to really, really push for this to happen. Because if not, then the models aren't going to change. The agencies, creative agencies, they're not going to do it on their own. I, I think the, the call it programmatic creative. That's going to be something we're going to be talking about in, in six months. Because we'll buy it, that URL, programmatic it. creative. Well, it, it's because these technologies make it so easy to show a different creative to a different audience. You just you don't have to water down your creatives with this national version anymore. But, but, I think but you don't see it happening. I think historically there has been a preciousness to brand creative, yeah. and I think social has started to kind of ease that to a large degree because I think people had to kind of relinquish a lot of control on their brands. But I still think there's a lot of preciousness that's there. And I think now it's going to be about being more and more agile so that as Shelly was talking about, when an ad gets served, you have the right suite of messaging that can be pulled from to serve that specific audience with whatever the right type of message is going to be. And there's going to be a lot of it in order to maximize what the promise, I think, of everything we're talking about is. So I think brands need to be really prepared for how they're going to go through that sequence. But I think that's where, look, we're in a, we're in a little, uh, you know, creative renaissance, I totally agree. I think we're in a creative funk, actually, at the moment. And I think it's going to take some time to get some things built out. I don't know any brand who has a creative agency hired who doesn't think they need to be spending more time just sitting around thinking about my brand. Okay, the, but the reality is, you know, you can't live on these one to two percent margins, as Bonham mentioned a little bit ago. It's just impossible. But if you think about the flow of talent, okay, we're going to be able to move a lot of the cost from just the distribution buying this, the crap stuff over to people spin out different people. I get it. But people are going to spend more time thinking about creative income brands. My fear is that the brands won't allow the agencies to receive that value. They're going to try to, you know, especially the, the, the procurement companies are going to attempt to try to keep it to an FTE model. The FTE model can't continue to exist in the future based upon what's going on if brands really want the best service. Uh, so, Bonnie, you, your organization was a pretty early adopter of kind of programmatic technologies, and y you rolled it out. How did you get that done with, with, the, with the problems that we're talking about and all the constituents you had in, in a global organization? Like, how did you actually sell this in and activate it? I mean, the, I mean, the raw fact of the matter is that the cost savings aspect alone makes it a decision that organizations have to take very seriously. Uh, so if you use that as kind of the Trojan horse to the bigger opportunity, then you can begin. But, um, you know, I feel very lucky that our organization saw the data opportunities and the preparation of that for a long-term gain as, as a key priority. So it made it a lot uh, it made it pretty easy. Uh, and then we're well wired as a global media function to kind of execute quickly and fast and you've seen the deals and how we land planes on the ground and that's all being operational, driven by operational excellence. So we focus a lot on that. But, um, but uh, I think, I, th I still think that while we're operating, we're not extracting the greatest amount of value because at the end of the day, we're not doing the things that we're all sitting up here talking about, which is creative is not truly being tailored. I mean, at the end of the day, we're still moving 15s and 30s from TV into online video across the globe. I mean, that's literally what's happening in most of uh, these organizations and because we haven't set with the creative agencies. We haven't figured out what that new process should be. And we also, I love the point that you said, most creative is considered precious. We're going to sit in a room and say, this is the thing. Go to the top of the mountain and share it with my disciples and they will buy our product. Well, now we have this unique opportunity where we can actually get a feedback loop from consumers and adjust and change. And But we're not really, the ecosystem isn't really built to do that quite yet. And so how do we build it to do that? And I think we, clients just have to focus more on, on the, on, you know, on, kind of leaning in with their partners to get past this journey. But so, so your path that, to get this done was kind of sell the cost savings, get procurement involved, and then get kind of the, the, the marketing team excited about all the, all the benefits. But, but cost we told savings a growth story. We told a growth story. 
Um, we told the growth story and, and then underlining that was the data story. But again, cost savings are not a bad way. <laughs> A any conversation about advertising technology and programmatic, I think you just have to talk about Google. And I if you don't know Sean's company, uh, look him up. They, they win these best place to work awards every year. And it's an amazing company, a lot of growth. And y you started by automating guaranteed buying, and now you're, you're uh, automating RTB. H how do you compete against Google in the long term? And w why wouldn't an advertiser just put all their eggs in, in the Google basket? It's a funny question. Um, first of all, if I was worried about competing with Google when I went to sleep at night, I wouldn't crawl out of bed in the morning. It's just that simple <laughs> because, you know, you can't control or influence what Google's going to do. I have a belief Google is going to get theirs. That's just the way Google is. Okay, there, there's going to be people who are going to live on the Google stack and that platform, and that'll be fine for some. Here's the truth, though. There's no question in my mind that in a very short you know, few years window, that there has to be platforms that arise in which a single buyer can go in and purchase all of their guaranteed direct, all of their programmatic direct, all their RTB that funnels into one data system that does automatic optimization and all the things you need to and that just runs it all the way through the operational aspect. So that's gonna happen. It's gonna have to sit on top of Google of Yahoo, of Microsoft, of Twitter, of Facebook, of LinkedIn. It's going to sit on top. And, by the way, all the exchanges and the thousands of publishers, both, you know, premium and long tail. That just is going to have to happen in our industry. Now, can Google become that company? I don't know. I mean, you know, they're conflicted with all the properties they own. Conflicted. You know, they yeah. Can't. I, yeah. Well, I mean, they're very conflicted. And I think the other piece, and I want to shut up because I want to make sure you're back, but, uh, is, is the connection, when you look at the long game, again, we're talking 20% of the marketplace right now when you're talking digital. A another 80% is over here. And so who's controlling the ability to do reach curves across the entire, p I mean, like, we need platforms that are actually connecting the dots in big ways, and, you know. And it, uh, Christian, you started off talking about how your organization's evaluating programmatic on, on both the advertiser side and, and the publisher content side. Wh which side do you think is gonna kind of, uh, generate greater greater leverage for the overall organization? I don't know that it's about one creating more leverage than the other. I think for us it's about looking at them both so that we can make the smartest choices for our business and actually leverage things like the data and creating high value audience segments that are relevant for both buying and selling. It's about collecting, protecting, and managing the data that we have across the enterprise to deploy it as effectively as we can. Um, I think we're looking at, at both sides, both from the um, ad tech partners. What are the right partners that we should be looking at? When should those be the same? When should they be different? Um, should they be the same in different geographies? Um, should they be different uh, around the world? And our hope is that by having a slightly more systematic look, which isn't to say we're looking at centralizing things, but what we're trying to do is learn together quickly, accelerate the rate of change within the organization, and make really smart decisions about the data, the technology, and the partners we're bringing to the table to make it easier for both the buying side and the selling side to kind of adapt to the change and be as prepared um, to take advantage of all the great things that are possible that we're talking about today. Well said, and uh, we're, we're out of time, so last question, and I, we'll need a quick answer to this. When will programmatic advertising just be advertising? When we stop calling it programmatic. I, I do think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's also hard work, and so I think it, it requires a lot more effort on the side, uh, on, on all sides, and so I think we have to be willing to put in the hard work, but I agree, when we just stop calling it that, and we just start today. Okay. I think I think that you know it's it's been this big scary weird word that everybody that gets freaked out about. Um, it it just you, it's we go through the pain to get there. It's going to be another two to three years. I think I said three years for digital, five years everything will be bought through a platform on some level, um, and and it, it, and we're just going to deal with it until then. But it's not something everybody needs to get so up in arms and over the you know mountain about and freaked out about. We it we didn't get programmatic panel, TV though, right? next next panel. Uh, well, thank you very much to, to our panelists. We appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Brett.